Welcome to today's program, Baker Broderick, All the World's a Stage. One of the great joys in studying history is uncovering figures or stories that have been forgotten through the passage of time. Emma Baker and George Broderick were two local figures who made a name for themselves on the world stage, literally. Both enjoyed major successes performing in concerts and musicals during the last quarter of the 19th century. Emma and George would walk the boards multiple times in the touring companies of Gilbert and Sullivan operettas and were cast in a variety of other musical entertainments of their day. Our story begins here in Aurora, Illinois. Emma Baker was born July 18, 1853 at 417 Fox Street, which is now 627 East Downer Place, and she was the child of Leonard and Clementine Baker. According to a Beacon article on the news of Emma's death, early in life, she gave evidence of the possession of an unusually fine voice as well as unusual beauty. It appears that her first stage performance took place in January 1873 when she was cast as Zeresh in a local production of The Oratorio of Esther. In reviewing this play, the Aurora Beacon noted, We have never seen an audience in Aurora so completely carried away by music. Miss Emma Baker in the character of Zeresh could not have been surpassed, and her rich, full alto voice greatly delighted her hearers, and they refused to be pacified until her principal solo was repeated. In fact, she had so impressed her audience that before the month was out, a benefit concert was arranged to raise money so she could further her musical education. She began performing in concerts by October, scheduling appearances in Naperville and at Aurora's Old City Hall. For the Naperville gig, she even arranged to have not one but two train cars chartered so her Aurora friends could attend in the nearby city. Her city hall date was pronounced a brilliant entertainment in every particular. Naperville was suitably impressed by her performance there, and within a month, she was receiving requests for another concert. By June 1874, she was actively organizing a concert at the German Free Methodist Church in conjunction with the local German class to give a performance entirely in that language. The entertainment will, we believe, be the first of its kind ever given in Aurora, and seats should be secured early, declared the Beacon. Three months later, it was noted that Baker was managing another performance to be held at the Coulter Opera House, in which she recruited some artists from Chicago. Proceeds from this entertainment were to be split between Miss Baker and the Women's Christian Association. Baker was drafted by the Chicago Madrigal Club to join their ensemble as a contralto, and in 1877, she was named to head a select school in DeKalb. The first evidence of Baker meeting George Broderick comes from a December 12, 1880 article in the music section of the Tribune, where it was noted that both singers were slated for two concert day, Christmas Day concerts that were to be delivered by the Reeve King Concert Company at Chicago Central Music Hall. George Broderick was born in Philadelphia May 6, 1855, and he belonged to a family that would make quite a mark in the thespian world. His brother William was another popular performer of the day, and William's daughter, Helen Broderick, was a stage and screen actress most famous today for her appearances in Top Hat and Swing Time with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Helen's son, Broderick Crawford, was a film and television star who won the Academy Award as Best Actor for his role in the 1949 version of All the King's Men. In May 1881, it was noted that Baker was singing in concert in Omaha, Nebraska, and within days, she was requested to appear there once more at their Sanger Fest in June. By the end of May, she was selecting costumes for a production of The Sleeping Queen. This was a play by N. W. Balfa, and Broderick was slated to sing a solo, fairly caught, during that production. The two were also on the bill to sing a duet at Chicago Central Music Hall. While at home here in Aurora, Baker was conducting vocal classes and delivered musicales with her students at private residences such as the O.S. Clayton House. In one of her class concerts, Etta Hawkins was a part of the ensemble. Aurora native Hawkins went on to a distinguished stage career herself and married William Morris, Broadway actor and later producer. Their son, Chester, was nominated for a Best Actor Academy Award for his work in the 1929 film, Alibi. In March, 1882, 
Baker was scheduled for a concert in Rochelle, and the Beacon predicted that the anticipation of our Rochelle friends of a rare musical treat will be fully realized, and they are fortunate in having secured our gifted contralto for the occasion. Two months later, it was noted that she was now a part of the Chicago Church Choir Company, and she was to appear as Lady Jane in a production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Patience. It was during the run of this play that Baker began styling herself as Mabella. In October 1882, she and her students were to give a performance at Aurora's First Baptist Church. This concert was delivered to a full house, and the Beacon Review touted the results, and especially Baker. Miss Baker, as always, thoroughly enthused her hearers, so much so that as she finished a second encore, they persisted for a long time in their efforts for another piece. Just before Christmas, she was once again at the Ultra Culture Opera House for Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance. This was a one-night-only showing with the Chicago Church Choir Opera Company, and tickets were 75 cents for general admission and $1 for premium seating. This production was evidently repeated in Chicago two months later, and the Tribune praised her by saying, Emma Baker made a decided hit as Ruth, singing the music with a fullness and resonance of voice and acting with a spirit and a dash. The Inner Oceans review of this performance noted that Miss Baker is without a doubt the finest alto in this city. And the Morning News further stated, Miss Baker's splendid contralto is so familiar to Chicago people that criticism is disarmed. In April, Baker and Broderick's paths crossed again as they were on the bill for a testimonial concert at the Central Music Hall. The article went on to state that Broderick would be back at the venue for the German Singing Society Congress later that year. The next month, the Aurora Daily Express printed an announcement that Baker, with the Chicago Church Choir Company, were organizing another concert to help Baker pay for her trip to Europe for further musical training. For this appearance in Aurora, she was performing in Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, Iolantha as the Fairy Queen. There was a big house for the event, and appearances indicate that she received substantial benefit from the entertainment. Also during that month, rumors began circulating in Chicago newspapers that wedding bells were in Baker's immediate future. The gossip was substantiated June 18th with the announcement that Baker and Broderick were to be married here in Aurora June 26th. The ceremony took place at the Park Place Baptist Church, and the Aurora Daily Express stated, Never on the stage or off did she ever look so handsome. Afterwards, it was off to the bride's house at 104 Fox Street to view the array of presents given to the newlywed couple. One St. Paul admirer sent her a diamond brooch for the occasion, and other jewelry included a diamond bracelet and earrings. George had to make do with a gold watch and chain from his wife. A dinner followed, and it was noted that the couple was shortly heading to Chicago, then to New York, to catch a ship for a honeymoon and some musical instruction in Europe. One item listed among the wedding presents was a unique album. This album exists today, and was recently offered for sale. Thanks to the inclusion of a photo featuring one of Coca-Cola's early advertising models, the price of this piece of Americana skyrocketed. So sadly, this important artifact of local history did not come home to roost where Baker, who kept her stage name, had first received it. While in London, the Daily Express noted that Baker was studying The Messiah with Alberto Ranker, who was a composer, conductor, and singing instructor, and he expresses great delight with her voice and vocal accomplishments. The article also stated that both sang in some concerts while in the British capital, and they were about to leave for Paris so Baker could study with Madame Lagrange. Before their departure for France, the Brodericks attended a performance at Windsor Castle and were introduced to Queen Victoria. They were back in America by late September, and Baker resumed giving vocal lessons here in Aurora. However, thanks to her busy schedule, she had to stop by the following May. She had performed as part of the Madrigal Club Tour of Ohio and in further Chicago dates with Iolantha. She and Broderick still managed to find time to sing at the First Methodist Church, and later 
Baker held another concert at the First Congregational Church here in Aurora. In June, the Aurora Daily Express noted that Baker had received an offer to join the Duff Opera Company, and in July, she was to star in the title role of the Milwaukee production of Offenbach's opera, The Duchess of Gerolstein. She and Broderick would be back in town in January and May 1885 for concerts at the New England Congregational Church and the First Congregational Church. They were also in town with her former pupils for a performance of the dress rehearsal in March. In July 1885 came their most pivotal roles yet, when the two appeared in the very first American performance of Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado at New York's Union Square Theater. This, unfortunately, was a pirated production, and it was closed after one night. One month later, they were able to reopen the show, but the authorized Doily Cart production was slated to open in two days, and the Union Square version closed after two weeks before transferring to the Grand Opera House in Brooklyn. Broderick played the part of Pishtush, and Baker was cast as Katisha. Undaunted, the pair continued their stage work. Baker was in Raleigh, North Carolina in January 1886 with an opera troupe that was touring the South. In January 1887, the Aurora Daily Express noted that she was off to New York after a most successful season. In September of that year, the Omaha Daily Bee published an advertisement for the grand opening of their new opera house. This was touted as the first appearance of the Broderick Opera Company. Both Baker and her husband were among those in the troupe. The October 13, 1887 Aurora Daily Express quoted an exchange from the New York Amusement Gazette that commented on this new venture by stating, So far, the Broderick Opera Company has been very successful, but then both Mr. Broderick and Emma Baker are really first-class artists. Successful it may have been, but it seems that the company was short-lived. Baker and Broderick's talent secured him a position with the Doily Cart Opera Company's traveling cast. This company was the authorized American ensemble to perform Gilbert and Sullivan's operettas, and in 1887, Broderick and Baker were cast to play the ghost of Sir Roderick and later Sir Desperd, and, for her, Dame Hannah in the Roadshow edition of Rudigore. May 1888 saw Baker finishing up appearances in Philadelphia and Washington, and later that year, she was with the John Stetson Opera Company touring as Dame Carruthers in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Yeoman of the Guard. Broderick was also appearing in another company's production of the same operetta as Lieutenant of the Tower. Baker was receiving book bookings from all over the country for concerts. In January 1889, she was with the Boston Opera Company, and she hoped to be able to bring that ensemble to Aurora. It does not appear she was successful in this venture. She spent much of 1890 in the touring companies for Gilbert and Sullivan's The Gondoliers as the Duchess of Plaza Toro, and in the role of Little Buttercup in HMS Pinafore. March 1891, Baker was finishing a tour of California and Seattle, and one month later, she was with the Lotta Company with Broderick in a production of Ina, in which she stated, My husband and I have the best parts in the play. The rest of April was spent in Columbus, Ohio, Philadelphia, and Boston. From there, both appeared in the nation's capital performing in Ina. The Washington Post said of the pair, They both do good work dramatically and musically, and they will be especially useful in the new musical comedy which is on the bills. The pair made a return trip to Aurora in July for a concert at the First Baptist Church. The Daily Express described the event as one of the most delightful entertainments of the kind ever given in this city. It was off to the Murray and David Troupe in 1892 for a performance of Pinafore in Buffalo with Broderick as the Pirate King and Baker as Ruth, the Pirate's Maid. The city's courier called Broderick's portrayal instant and gratifying. He joined a power and expression in song that made him the beau ideal of the character. The Sunday News Review was also filled with praise. Of Baker, they stated, she has worn a warm place in the hearts of the star patrons. 
George Broderick is undoubtedly the best basso heard here since Myron W. Whitney. From here, Broderick appeared in January 1893 as Alvina the Innkeeper in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mountebacks, starring Lillian Russell at New York's Golden Theater. Baker was also cast in this production as Ultrice, his niece. After an 1894 stint in Atlanta involving both, Baker's next booking was at Chicago's McVickers Theater for Athenia. Here she was slated to play the part of a prophetess in a somewhat satirical portrait of Theosophical Society founder Madame Blavatsky. When the news of this production was announced, Baker received a letter from Mrs. O.W. Day of Oak Park warning the actress against the supernatural forces that could be unleashed by playing such a part. Mrs. Day was interviewed by the Tribune, and here she indicated that if she, Baker, thinks too hard on her role, she will unconsciously assume or succumb to the will of the spirit of Madame Blavatsky, and then she, Baker, is lost. All of this effort was to no avail, as it was reported, unless the spirit of Madame Blavatsky does its evil work between now and night, Miss Baker will play her part unhesitatingly and fearlessly. Broderick was also cast in this play as Darius Hull. While the Tribune review of the opening performance was not terribly positive, most of the criticism was about the storyline and musical numbers needing additional work. The article went on to state that the scene between Rosalind, Gunn's oldest wife, and Senator Hull, done by Miss Mabella Baker and George Broderick, gotten up to afford a startling resemblance to David R. Hill, a Missouri senator, was a capital bit of work. We next catch up with Broderick, May 27, 1895, in a New York production of Hamlet II, a musical satire of Shakespeare's original play in which Broderick was cast as the ghost. He and Baker would travel to San Francisco in October for an Actors Fund benefit with the Tivoli Opera Company, and they were in an ensemble scheduled to perform selections from Lucia and Ernani. Given the incomplete nature of the information gathered to date on Baker and Broderick, we skip a few years until 1897 when we find Baker in a two-act musical comedy called The Circus Girl. Here, she played the talkative wife of the circus proprietor. In November 1898, she was in the first cast of John Philip Seuss's The Bride-Elect being performed at the Columbia Theater in Chicago. The following year, she once again made the first cast for Seuss's new piece, Chris and the Wonderful Lamp. In the meantime, Broderick had a three-year run playing in The Burgomaster. Then he made a series of recordings for a variety of fledgling companies, including Edison, Berliner, Zonophone, and the Consolidated Talking Machine, all in 1900 between March and November. These early sound recordings for Berliner included 14 different arias, light operatic pieces, bass vocal standards, and popular selections of the era. His work for the Consolidated Talking Machine Company was primarily focused on poetic or monologue recitations. Broderick's career on shellac ended when he and Baker moved permanently to Aurora late in the year. We next catch the two of them in Pittsburgh, May 1902, as cast members of Sis Hopkins. They were playing to packed houses at the Bijou Theater. George Broderick was exceedingly funny as the undertaker's man who was working on a commission. He rendered a good solo in a fine bass voice. Baker played his wife in this musical comedy. Broderick's next role cast him as the emperor in A Chinese Honeymoon. Another success that occupied him for two years along with Baker. During a return engagement of this piece in Chicago, Broderick became ill and was forced to go to the hospital. He was diagnosed with pure pneumonia, and from there, he was sent home to Aurora, where he remained sick for four weeks. His condition resulted in paralysis, and he was unconscious for the last two days of his life. George Broderick died May 10, 1905, at 410 Fifth Avenue, and he was buried in Spring Lake Cemetery. 
Baker's next professional venture was probably her most famous when she made the Broadway cast of The Parisian Model. This was a Florence Ziegfeld Anna Held musical that debuted on The Great White Way November 27, 1906 and had a successful run of 179 performances. For this musical comedy, Baker played the role of Mrs. Silas Goldfinch, a part she got by default when the producer's first selection was unavailable. When the play reached Chicago, the Tribune noted, We have been accustomed to extraordinary costume displays and former Ziegfeld offerings, but they fade into commonplaceness when recalled in the presence of this latest effort. The show itself was relatively risque for the time, and the reviewer acknowledged this by saying, Time and again there were moments when the women in the audience must have quaked for fear of what might have come next, but their fears were allayed, and although the limits of propriety were reached, they were not overstepped. Baker would appear in a few more Broadway productions in the following years. She was cast as Mrs. Barnaby Bessel, the Queen, in Mr. Hamlet of Broadway. That opened in December 1908 and ran for 54 performances. In 1910, Baker was in The King of Cadonia, that featured music partially written by Jerome Kern. Then there was The Lady from Lobster Square of 1910 and The Three Romeos of 1911. These appear to be her last acting jobs on The Great White Way. Later in 1911, she was in The Girl I Love, and it appears her stage career ended in 1913 with a trip to Washington. Baker returned to Aurora, where she spent much of her remaining years as a vocal instructor. Baker herself would pass away October 16, 1936, aged 83 years. She was laid to rest beside her husband in Spring Lake Cemetery. This concludes our program, Baker and Broderick, All the World's a Stage. We hope you enjoyed it, and join us again for more programming. Thank you. <laughs>